Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldrige Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence webinar, Innovation, the New Transformation. We believe you'll enjoy today's webinar. Innovation is referred, referenced 108 times in the current healthcare criteria, and today's webinar will take a fresh look at innovation and in customer expectations and engagement. Before we get started today, I want to take a minute and recognize all of our great sponsors and special thanks to the members of the Mac Baldrige Society who serve as trustees of the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence. Here is today's agenda. Today's guests include Roger Spullman, Senior Advisor and Co-host, Baldrige Foundation Leader Dialogue Program. Panelists, Angie Frank, CEO about healthcare, Chuck Peck, co-host, Baldrige Foundation Leader Dialogue Program, Darren Versillo, co-founder and chief medical officer about healthcare, and Ben Sawyer, industry expert with about healthcare. Audience questions at the end will be moderated by Ben Sawyer and be followed up by myself doing the closing. And now I will turn it over to Roger to get us started. Great, Jerry. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today. It's a great group that we have and really diverse group of healthcare leaders and, and folks that are involved in the industry. And we're looking forward so much to your questions. Jerry, I want to thank you and the Baldridge Foundation for making this all possible. The uh, These pernicious problems that we're dealing with in healthcare today, one of the keys for solutions, finding solutions are uh, found in the Baldridge foundation in the many programs that you offer. So thank you so much for that. And then also you have uh, seen on the screen that About Healthcare is our sponsor for our Leader Dialogue podcast and then also a member of the Mac Baldridge Society. And uh, if you looked at that slide, you see that our panelists, aside from Chuck and myself, are all executives with About Healthcare, and you're very familiar if you listen to our podcast with Chuck, excuse me, with, with Darren and with Ben, our colleagues, and then Angie Franks. We just had a great conversation, great podcast with Angie. Uh, so uh, I encourage you to go back and listen to those things in the archives. They're very, very relevant, very current. But we we thought, given... Uh, some of the information that has, excuse me, excuse me, has recently uh, hit the news. Um, we're not, as we've said in the past, just admiring the problem, but we're trying to come up with practical solutions to some of the challenges that you, those of you who are active in healthcare, are faced with. And and so, you know, this is a great panel for that, and we're grateful for. Uh, about healthcare for your sponsorship, but also your leadership and your example in terms of how to be innovators in this new world that we're facing. So we're going to get to the panel discussion in just a few minutes, but I want to talk, uh, sort of set the stage with some slides. We're grateful that Kaufman Hall has allowed us to use these slides to share this information with you. And so when we talk about a tipping point, um, this is not a pretty picture when we talk about what hospitals are experiencing, and it is, in fact, the worst margins of the pandemic. Um, we've seen margins plummet, especially when you take out the CARES Act money, and, uh, and the slide shows what the, the volumes are uh, and the margins, excuse me, the margins here with the CARES Act money and without, and uh, it's just it's unmistakable that we're experiencing some tremendous difficulty. And to all of you on the call for in this webinar, you know what the reasons behind this are. There are labor expenses that are way out of control and we've lost a lot of patients. We're gonna talk about where those patients are going. Are they simply healthier? No. Are they receiving healthcare in other venues? Yes. And so we'll talk a bit about that. And as you see, these are the national volume results. So lower, lower margins, lower volumes. Where is that? Where's that coming from? So um, without those funds to offset the damage, what are we expected to do? We have to think strategically now. We've, we know that all of you have these day-to-day -day pressures and it's, and it's, um, Boy, we've talked about this on previous podcasts and webinars. You know, are you taking the time to sit back and recognize what are the trends? 
uh, what is causing all of this before jumping right into solutions. And that's what we're hoping to ask you today and have a good conversation around that. So reassess these, finding out what are the leading and lagging indicators? What really has changed? And so when you sit around your executive leadership team table, um, talking about what's going on around us, what is likely to be a current, just an urgent problem in the environment, and what's likely to be a long-term problem that we're going to have to come up with a creative solution for these things. So, so taking the time to just sort of stop in the midst of the chaos and reassess what is causing this, what has changed. And uh, I know I just want to, you know, at any point here, see if our panelists would like to weigh in and talk about some of the things that they're seeing in their part of the business. Yeah, I can just jump in really quickly, Roger. I Thanks, think man. that leading and lagging the indicator uh, thing is really interesting because typically when you're managing performance improvement, you're looking at your your key performance indicators is kind of the lagging indicators, right? So for example, if you're looking at volumes and you're used to having 40% of your volume being through your ED and, and you know, maintenance of volume or growth of volume is a key, uh, your key performance indicator, then the leading indicators are typically your process or input variables that change. And if you suddenly see volumes decrease like that, you have to reassess the leading. What's happening? What, what has changed in terms of input and process that is now resulting in that KPI that we have been so familiar with now changing? Is it because there is a change in our network integrity? In other words, is there a change in our clinical integrated network or ACO? Or are there other forces? Are there now new players in our catchment area that are adjusting volume? Like maybe Walmart net down the road opened a whole brand new care center, and now they're directing traffic in terms of where patients are going to go through a preferred network. I, I'm just giving you examples, but when you're looking at crises like we're talking about here with tipping points, reassessing those leading and lagging indicators becomes sort of foundational to understanding the picture and what are those driving factors. So that's just my, my thoughts, and Angie, Chuck. Darren, and, what yeah, do you guys think? Ben, this is Chuck. I, I think the other thing, and I, this this is a hard one, uh, no question about it, but really understanding the contribution margins of all of your service lines, I think has really become critical. Um, you know, I, I think many, many organizations, because if, for instance, you know, you may be the only health system hospital within your geographic area, and you've in the past been all things to all people because that's just what you had to do. Um, but if you don't have a, a margin at all, then you're not gonna have a mission at all. And so really mm -hmm. understanding the contribution margin that each of your service lines is providing you is really critical because you know as you go forward, you may have to reassess whether you can continue to be all things to all people. You know, and that yeah, begs the fact, question too. Oh, sorry, Angie. Just just a comment on, yeah. on Chuck's uh, observation. You know that begs the question of, you know, in the old days we said, well, you know, we're the only ones providing this service. Well, there, there's probably a reason because other providers, Ben mentioned a few, are very happy to come in and provide competition to our health systems around the country and take those high margin areas away from us. Angie. Yeah, I was just going to build off of um, the prior comments. And, you know, if, you, if we look at this through a strategic lens and say, are there things we can control, we as healthcare system executives? And, you know, in the past, what we used as our control point and our control lever was, was cost. We'd manage the bottom line by, by cutting costs, and we've lost that lever. And so what we're saying right now is, you know, and I'll introduce like a new term, I'm just kind of making it up here, and that is revenue shifting. How do you get focused on the service lines, focused on the business that you can and should capture, and truly are the only ones, um, when, I, when I look at what's happening in terms of erosion of revenue and margin for health systems, the erosion is happening at, the, at things that can be more commoditized, like outpatient urgent care visits, yeah. whether it's Walmart or CVS 
or um, or uh, um, you know um, on the on the post acute Wal side, Walgreens, etc. You know, it doesn't matter who's coming in and grabbing pieces of that revenue for those healthy and well patients. That's just eroding some of your um, revenue inside of the health systems. Where are the areas that you as a health system can focus on that is defensible, that only you can provide, that is um, necessary services, and there's growth in, the, in these markets, and that is acute and complex care. So how do we shift the advantage to a health system to say, how do we capture more of those acute and complex care patients? How do we do that with a service line orientation? How do we utilize our very stressed and, and um, you know, important critical resources to deliver care for those acute and complex patients that only you can do. And, and I think that is, that is the new name of the game. And that is about a focus on revenue and a focus on capturing the right patients and putting up defenses around um, the, the acute and complex patients that only hospital systems can care for. Speaking of that acute and complex care, you know, Dr. Versillo, uh, if our audience doesn't know, you know, uh, Dr. Versillo, Darren is a hospitalist intensivist, and uh, that's, you know, you're you're right in the bullseye of what Angie was talking about, you know, taking care of those very complex patients. And unfortunately, you can't do this, you can't do everything you need to do, or you, you need support, you need help. And right. You know, that's something we've been talking about. And Angie, I, I know that you're not in Minneapolis right now. You're at a meeting uh, in another state. But yeah. uh, boy, I just read this morning about a nurses strike, strike. in mm -hmm. in yeah. Minneapolis, 15,000 nurses going on strike. You know, what does that kind of thing do to you, Darren? Well, you know, um, <laughs> there are so many factors here. And Roger, I think you've hit on one of them that's uh, as important as all the rest, you know, the Kaufman Hall report that you put up here um, and in that previous slide, when you're seeing a drop in the number of basis points that they've pointed out um, in, in margin and well, revenue as well, um, it's enough to make somebody wanna run for the hills or jump out the window, uh, proverbially, if they're uh, trying to run the, uh, the organization. And as you look at all of these various factors, we're coming out of the pandemic, there's been a shift um, in uh, where patients are coming from and where they're going to. So that's in flux. Um, we're in the middle of summer and many organizations, many hospital systems around the country are in the summer slump right now. I know there are some pockets where uh, potentially uh, the numbers of patients actually go up, but the vast majority of hospital systems experience a slump during this time as uh, we don't deal with the winter month issues that oftentimes bring people flooding into the ER. So as you look at what's changed coming out of the pandemic, the effect of the summer uh, slump and other seasonality change, and then throw a massive um, reduction in workforce and strikes and things like that and increased uh, costs associated with those. Um, it, it Again, it's, it's very difficult, very complex, but I think in all of this, there truly is an opportunity. And I think it's been pointed out by each of the comments that came before this. Now is the time where we can rally the leadership, sit down and think strategically and not get bogged down in thinking that doing things the old way is what we have to continue to do and just keep going that way because it'll sort itself out um, in the future. And so um, I, I believe that you know from a clinical practice perspective, as we look at limited resources, uh, perhaps decreased demand, but perhaps a matching between demand and resources. We absolutely, like Angie just said, have to make the choices of uh, how we're going to address the demand of patients coming in, how we're going to leverage our resources and staffed capacity across the organization, getting patients to the right place, which doesn't always mean specifically what exactly do we need to do for that patient, but where are we going to put them within our multi-hospital organization and for what length of time and how are we going to leverage um, our partnerships with the next, be that um, another hospital, skilled nursing facility, home with home health, and at a different cadence than we ever have before and controlling that at a level that we never have before to keep that throughput moving. Great observation. Thank you, Darren. Um, so we have another um, 
wave coming at us. And again, just to recognize what's happened over the last couple of years is this impact of consumerism. We have patients now, let's not forget about patients. They're at the center of what we're talking about. And we were forced in the pandemic and uh, trying to decide about COVID, what we're going to do, who we're going to let in the hospital and how we're going to treat this. So we've sort of lost track of some of the, some people we took care of only the very, very sick. And what about all the other people who had ongoing needs, some of them chronic care, some of them episodic care, but what happened inadvertently, of course, is that people figured out a way to get their health care outside of our systems, perhaps, in more non-traditional ways. We've also had providers who've left the, the traditional system, the employment model, and gone to sort of self-employment, or they've gone to concierge or direct care medicine. Uh, boy, I've just seen a lot of that. I don't know about the rest of you, but that's that really has been an attractive opportunity for some people. And, and so we've got consumers very savvy looking for opportunities to make their own decisions about their health care and pro procuring it in other ways, taking control of their own health. So, um, you know, we've got a list of things in the patient journey, but I'm just curious about uh, our panelists. What are your thoughts about, about this? Well, there's shift. one thing that's really interesting that we hadn't brought up much in the previous webinar and podcast, which our our viewing audience should listen to because there's some very good nuggets and insights there. But one of them is the new ownership and proactive stance that employers are taking. So as most of us know, employers, particularly large employers, have been relatively passive in the in the past as it relates to really controlling or curating the experience for their workforce. And they've largely depended on <clears throat> their insurance provider for benefit plan design and for essentially negotiating with, with provider systems. That's over. They are now uh, hiring business intelligence people to analyze the claims data, understand exactly how their employers are, are employees are using it. Uh, they don't like the elevating costs. They haven't liked having to cost shift uh, high deductibles and co-pays to the their employee population uh, it isn't as much of a differentiator now for hiring and so they want to get into the game in terms of determining who they're going to use and how they're going to use it and during covid when a lot of their healthier employees couldn't gain access to traditional systems they started providing it they started putting clinics on their on their workforce sites and so forth so that was another element you had, right, that was adding to this consumerism. You had outside uh, non-traditional players in the market. We talked about that previously. But there also has been this pretty significant increase in employer-based control. So for providers, when you're used to do case rate negotiations with your set of insurers that were kind of in your area, that's sort of not, you know, the main uh, entree anymore. You you have a whole bunch of different buyers that have different criteria that are looking for cost and quality considerations. So it's a it's a it's a moving market. Boy, that's uh, it certainly is, and and not to be lost in this conversation is uh, we've certainly got consumers working, uh, trying to find take control of their health care and trying to find new options, but. Um, boy, not to be lost is the fact that providers are trying to find other options as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my friends know this. I just had a little little incident myself. You know, I had a little bicycle accident and uh, went over the bars, broke my clavicle. And, uh, you know, and, and I was treated in the emergency department, which was a great experience. And but then my referring uh, surgeon, the the orthopedist who fixed this repair said, we're going to do it in the outpatient surgery center. Now the hospital owned part of it, just a percentage, but my experience in the outpatient surgery center was pretty interesting because the providers were happy. They were, they weren't sitting around their day ended reasonably because the cases moved very quickly one after the other. 
the anesthesiologist there, there are a couple of friends of mine who are brothers who are anesthesiologists. They had left the hospital completely working hundred percent in the outpatient surgery center. I mean, so they're, they're choosing with their feet. They're choosing to um, not to, to distance themselves from some of the problems that the systems are having with staffing and with inefficiency and, and that sort of thing. So I haven't gotten my bill yet. I don't know if that, if that turned out good for me or not, but the experience was good. But Roger, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I love this graphic uh, that we have on the right side of the screen here, the modern patient journey. It really makes me reflect on um, so many of the elements that go into assuring in a healthcare, modern healthcare uh, business uh, that you're addressing all of the needs of the patient and many of these areas we've just paid lip service to in the past. Yeah. And, you know, it, it boils all the way down to that last one, leakage, uh, which obviously we don't want to have. And it, it, it just makes me, it reminds me of a couple of situations that I've dealt in practice with. Of course, I'm a hospitalist, but a lot of my patients come from specific clinics where that patient relationship is longstanding and they want to keep that. Uh, there are also relationships between the hospital and those clinics. And oftentimes in our modern organizations, they're all under one umbrella. There's a healthcare organization that has hospitals and has clinics and employee physicians and freestanding EDs and so on and so forth. And they want to own that relationship uh, with the patient and keep them in there to provide all of those um, services from uh, for them. And yet, so often in the past, We've fallen down. We, we look great for quality. We want to be able to provide the various services. But for example, I was involved with a healthcare organization where it took 45 minutes um, for any phone call that came in of a patient calling the clinic to get through to somebody. Mm -hmm. And they were put on hold and went through uh, hold trees and uh, things like that. And what we've seen at About Healthcare in many places, the referral process whether that's a direct admission or an interfacility transfer coming into the hospital, being a broken process that just takes too long and people hang up and don't complete it and they lose opportunities, or even on the um, ambulatory referral side. If a primary care physician wants to get their patient referred to an orthopedic surgeon, are they leaving it to chance and that uh, primary care doctor is sending the patient to an orthopedist that takes his or her surgeries to a different hospital system yeah. than our own or even referrals to skilled nursing. We have to grab hold at, of those opportunities to um, gain and maintain those patient relationships within our organization and not have stumbling blocks there instead well, Darren, of great process. Darren, look at what you just said though. If, if we break down what you were just talking about, we have to break it into two groups. Um, and I'm going to use I'm going to use business terms B2C, which is largely you know the technology and the ease of use for our patients to get access to care inside of our system. Lots of focus on that. Meanwhile, what have we been doing to focus on what I would call B2B, your doctors and your nurses, and making it easy and your case managers, making it easy for your clinicians to operate inside of your health system, to get patients to the right place of care for the care that they need, to keep them in the system. And we haven't done that much as a healthcare organization. And, and I, think, I think the impact starts showing up where it's easier to call somebody else, or it's easier to send the patient out, or it's easier to not do anything and just hand the patient their discharge instructions and let them figure it out. Right. Our, our opportunity is to really start driving more loyalty, um, more alignment, more ease of operating inside of our health systems for the patients that we can serve better than anybody else. And those are people that are really sick. And we have to have, we have to have the, the channels to make it easy to make an appointment and, and better hours and faster response time from, from maybe doctor's offices and physician's offices on scheduling an appointment. But if you ignore the physician channel, and, and you ignore your nurses and your case managers and their life continues to be, it's very complex, very siloed, very disconnected. You are losing the most valuable 
patience to your health system in terms of contribution margin, and you are losing the loyalty um, and and um, engagement of your team. And so I think you know I think where we tend to to focus here, um, you know, at about is shifting that thought to say not just to think about the consumer because it is at the end of the day about the patient but this is about giving access for that patient through the person that they trust most when they're really sick and really in need and that is their care provider and that's going to be a physician referring them that is going to be or transferring the patient it's going to be the nurse um, or the case manager on the discharge and the care in between. And so um, we can't ignore that channel. And I think they've largely been left to, uh, uh, you know, left to figure it out on their own. Roger, there, there's one other bucket that I, I just I just have to mention here. Um, and and I, I think a lot of the folks listening to us from, from health systems are, are probably thinking about this, having been on sort of all different sides, including the payer side. Uh, of this equation. You know, we've been talking so far, and, and we're going to be talking more on, on what I'm about to say in a little bit, but what we've been talking about so for, far has really been mostly the demand side of the equation. And, you know, it there's this whole bucket of, you know, we, we've got two big buckets. We've got people on the uh, in our audience, the physicians, the nurses, the case managers, Angie was just talking about, the ones that are actually doing all of the work and providing the care. But then we have this huge other bucket. And that's this bucket of all of the people out there that are um, responsible for, quote unquote, paying for the care. And I think what we've seen in the, in the, in the pandemic is we've seen this bucket, and I'm going to use the, just the payers as one of those sub buckets within this big bucket, the payer revenue, the payer margin, the payer bottom line over the last two years has got bigger, 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 bigger. And I, I think the, the folks that are that are on the line that are providing the care have to figure out ways to get more of that premium dollar, that money that's sitting in that bucket that's ever expanding, to figure out how to generate more revenue per unit because we can have more and more and more units coming into our system. But if the revenue per unit is going down for us and going up for them, there's going to continue to be this imbalance. And, and I, I know we've had some really good podcasts to talk about this whole idea of pay providers, direct to customer, direct to consumer, direct mm -hmm. to, to business. And you know we've got to talk about how, how the, the, the folks on the phone can better manage the risk associated with trying to get more of that premium dollar. Because at the end of the day, the two curves that are crossing so severely now, the, the expense curve and the revenue curve, we've got to figure out a way to flatten those out and then get them into the proper balance. And the only way to do that is to gain more control over some of the premium that's out there. Chuck, you know, you brought up such an interesting point was is this mythology or did they actually did the insurance companies actually do better during the pandemic because they uh fewer of their patients or their excuse me their customers or subscribers actually sought care or were able to seek care correct that that is what that is the, the thought i mean a lot of a lot of the reason that our audience is seeing much sicker much higher costly patients right now is because a lot of those folks put off the care or weren't able to access the care because when they tried to, those beds and those those people seeing them were busy taking care of all those sick COVID patients. And, you know, I, I think that unfortunately, I know this is perverse, that really enriched the folks who are, you know, gathering those dollars within that big bucket that I talked about. And we've got to figure out a way to get some of those dollars rightfully back into the hands of the folks that are on the phone that are actually doing the care. And there's this huge imbalance now that I think was is even worse than it was before. I mean, it was already bad enough before, but it's gotten significantly worse. But in order to gain control of some of those dollars, we on the, on the care side have to be able to control what we're doing so that we can see the maximum revenue per unit 
that is only fairer for us to be receiving for taking all that care, doing yeah. all that care. And I think we've got to figure that out. How do we gain some control over those dollars that right now are just going to raise stock prices of a lot of the yeah. folks that supposedly represent the employers? But Chuck, is that as simple as like, is that, I mean, I don't want to imply that this is simple, but it's health systems being in a position to take on financial risk yes. for patients and, yes. and in order. So what do you have to be good at? What competencies have to be present inside of that health system to be able to take on financial risk successfully? And yes. you said yeah. this word many times, and that is controls. If you don't have the ability to control getting patients into your system and keeping them in your network, you can't take on financial risk. Right. So that level of operations has to be in place. And that is beyond the four walls of the inpatient setting. That is across your entire health system. Those controls, you've got to have that ability to take on risk. And you're exactly right. I mean, there, there weren't claims coming in because the front door was shut. So people weren't seeking care. So the payers, you know, we still all paid our premiums. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah, didn't get we right. didn't get that bad. We didn't get a pre nobody even, even, nobody even turned the, my premium up. <laughs> even the auto companies, you know, did you right. get a rebate from your uh, no. your auto insurance because no, we were driving, driving like Michigan? We did that. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So no there rebates. is a really good podcast that we did uh, a couple podcasts ago. If people want to go on the Leader Dialogue website with um, Scott Nordland, who is the Chief Strategy Officer and Chief Growth Officer for Banner Health. And he describes with great clarity this decision-making process and how they did a, a joint venture with Aetna and became a payvider. And they now have about 350,000 covered lives under plan. And it, it accounts for almost $3 billion of their of their operating top-line revenue. That, that is a distinctive movement. And the providers, payviders are coming out of either the insurance side Right, like United Healthcare and Optum, or coming out of the provider side, and some would argue that the providers have a bit of an advantage in that regard from the standpoint of consumer loyalty because they've been there in their communities providing those kinds of services to them. But now they have this opportunity, as as Chuck and Angie were just pointing out, to be both the insurer and the provider in that community and more uniquely deliver. Uh, the care needs and the insurance needs to the, the the communities that they serve. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to characterize the insurance providers as the, you yeah. know, the enemy here, or, or just trying to keep every dollar. And that they they exist to to provide care. They do it in a way that protects employers and you know the people who are paying the premium, most of the premium. But um, but they're they have to make decisions too. And and I think your example, Ben, of Banner. And Chuck, in our conversation that we we had with Scott Nordland, was a good one because the, that's a case where the insurance company says, "Let's do this together. Let's figure out how we can provide high well, that's value." Well, that's to what I'm suggesting. I'm I'm not suggesting that the payers are the enemy. No. What I am suggesting, though, is that there needs to be a different relationship today between the people providing the care and the people insuring the care, mm -hmm. and the and that. You know, historically, there's been this, you know, animosity where once a year, if you're over here on the people providing the care side, you're going into the negotiations and it's always this um, very, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's fight for everything that you can possibly get on the fee for service side. And th that money that we used to think was there, it's still in the system. But less and less of it is coming to the people that are yeah. providing the care. And we need to redistribute some of it and make it a fair balance. And the only way to do that is to have a different relationship between the people providing and the people insuring. And that's what yeah. I'm suggesting that sure. needs to happen. This is a really important call out. And, and so, by the way, just quick time check, uh, Roger, the panelists. So we're, we've got about 25 minutes left, I guess. And, and I, I, know we, I know you wanted to unpack this, Roger, yes. from our friends at the Health Management Academy who did an amazing job of interviewing a lot of these leading health systems to say, how are you all actually approaching this? So if 
Shall, shall we go ahead and dive into yeah, that? Yeah, let's do next? that. This is this is a great slide. Thank you, Ben. A great slide. You know, how are these large health systems, these leading health systems, planning to increase spending in, in light of everything we've just been talking about? And so, you know, look at this in the light blue. This is some somewhat increase or significantly increases the dark blue. So we're going to spend more money on capital projects and our electronic health records and cybersecurity and the digital front door. Um, you know, these are indications. We look at these, you know, other clinical staff, cloud migration. But the, these are indicators that we're trying to do something differently than we had previously. And then it's also interesting to look at the decrease in spending. How are these systems planning to decrease spending? And, and uh, the, the significantly decrease, well, we're just going to cut back on corporate offices. And it's sort of a dream to cut back on nurse travelers. Just saying we're not going to pay for travelers <laughs> doesn't quite solve the problem. <laughs> There's a lot behind that. So, you know, here's the, here's the main themes you know, that we find from these, uh, the study that Health Management Academy did. So workforce planning, enhancing flexibility and generating pa patients in this pipeline and, and, uh, and getting new people into health, uh, uh, health professions and, uh, and then adoption of tech and automation, that digital front door. So, um, you know, what are your thoughts, panelists, on, on what the uh, major health systems in the country are trying to do to cope? Well, it, it put them behind the eight ball with the significant disruption in workforce and supply chain. Yeah. I mean, that cost structure definitely hampered health systems' ability to really be innovative. As, as this chief strategy officer says, you know, workforce is, is the reason we can't meet our margin goal. I, it doesn't mean you 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 can stop, obviously, trying to figure out how to really innovate in a time of stress, which we'll talk about more. But clearly, the workforce and the supply cost issue has to be brought under control to be able to get yourself in a position to really do the kinds of things that we're talking about. Yeah, I, I think, you know, my comment here is I think the Health Management Academy does a fabulous job of gathering primary research and publishing it in ways that are um, so easy to absorb and understand and appreciate. Um, when I've looked at some of the research that they've done, this exact research that Ben just walked through and look at it from the year prior and, and HMA publishes some of this stuff, you can see a very significant shift from what they were thinking in 2021 to what they were thinking in 2022. And, and to me, what that says is so many of these things that ended up happening as fallout from the pandemic, from staffing and supply chain, et cetera, was just unexpected and a big wake up call for for all of us, not just providers, not payers, but for the entire industry and all of us who are personal, you know, we all utilize the, the sure. health system as patients. And so, you know, I would just go back to one other point that Darren made earlier, and that is it's easy to look at all this stuff and go, oh, my gosh, there's so many problems and there's so many things broken and the financial situation is so overwhelming. I look at it and I go, gosh, it is so rich with opportunity right now to say the opportunity to really transform and to really start looking back and saying, hey, the old system worked until it didn't. And now it's not coming back. So now we have to like start chunking it up piece by piece and putting the pieces back together and make it better than it was before. And I think we just have an incredible opportunity to make that happen. And I, and I think this should be a time of uh, super exciting time actually for uh, for those of us in healthcare for that Angie, reason. If, I, if yeah. I could just piggyback on what you said, you know, this just reminds me, if you go back and look at the transition and transformation of the airline industry through the uh, 70s and 80s when you know costs were up and there were there needed to be a massive change in how the large uh, airline industry um, operated because things were changing around them and they really were looking at how do we make incremental changes in the way we do things and then out of the blue the low cost airlines just blindsided mm -hmm. them and you either fell by the wayside or you figured out how to move on and I feel like right. we're just in the same situation right now and you know um 
kudos to those who are really looking at um, how to um, optimize their organizations. But wow, I think they really need to get to the table and start thinking strategically of how they're going to fit into this new world of how healthcare is provided. And, uh, you know, some are going to fall by the wayside and some are going to go through massive, you know, M&A activity and then emerge victorious like we see uh, many of them now. But um, uh, boy, they got to think outside the box and yeah. uh, and find some new levers to pull. And, and as we look at these um, responses in these themes, you know, this one, the hybrid care revolution and, and Darren, just to, what you were talking about, it's we're finding that those who are tasked with the responsibility or the opportunity, as Angie says, the opportunities here are, are people who buy their, the origin of their companies is to create margin, to create value for shareholders. You know, it's people in the, in the for-profit world who are looking at healthcare and saying, you know what, this can be done better. It can be done more efficiently. And you know what, if we do it right, we can make some money at it. And, and our health systems have been sort of stuck in in this, you know, we're we're assets of the community. We we we're major employers in the community, and so you know we have this mind shift that has to take place. And and I'm not suggesting that we just move away from, um, you know, serving the community to serving ourselves or just focusing on those things where we can make a significant margin. But we do have to open our eyes and really really focus on these things and right. uh, and take advantage of the opportunities because well, that's what and, our consumers need. Yeah, and then a nonprofit organization operating with a for-profit mindset yeah. is putting, you know, you've got to have the margin to deliver on the mission and I know yeah. we all know that, but but that's not a bad thing and I think I think to to echo your point Roger Look at the bright spots. Look at the people yeah. who are doing this really well, and and maybe maybe um, not struggling as much. Say, hey, what are they doing better and differently, and how can I apply that to my organization? I also would just say it's easy it's easy to sit here and talk like we're telling health systems. Here's what you need to do. I think I think it's really important to know it's we got to all come together and and sit down and figure out how to solve these problems together it's not just you know us uh, um, dictating here to a bunch of hospital systems how you've got to run your business this is oh, no. this yeah. is uh, yeah. you know an opportunity to work together to make it, it happen well said. so so to that point angie i you know this analogy comes up. It's almost like when you're reimagining operations and trying to figure this out in a collaborative way, it's almost like healthcare is Apollo 13 moment. Like failure is not an option. And everybody has seen this movie. I mean, the, the Apollo 13 astronauts are in dire straits. They're not going to land. They have to get them back. The, the spaceship wasn't designed for that. And the engineers are telling uh, Gene Krantz, who is the Apollo 13 mission director, it's not designed that way. And he's like, I don't care what it was designed to do. I care what it can do, right? It's it's sort of like when you look at the well thought out themes that the leading health systems are doing, you really have to complement them. The question of innovating, though, in times of stress is not easy. And what you're doing is kind of like what these engineers are showing on the right here. It's like, okay, I've got this square thing that is on that spaceship and and this is what we have we have this round thing that has to fit in that square hole you know kind of a thing and and figuring out with what you have to be able to take advantage of the market that you're in understanding the competition understanding your your consumer needs and what you're trying to accomplish really becomes that moment right And, and you know, let's not assume. When I look at the list of our, our uh, participants today, some of, this is almost thirty years ago, Ben. <laughs> so, yeah. so if some people haven't seen it uh, <laughs> or weren't born, yeah, I'm, I'm declaring my age here. Yeah, for sure. I, I, you know, another one is MacGyver. You know, and I don't. That's old. <laughs> too, you know, see, 
sheets right. of plywood, a, a smoke detector, and a box of paper. Well, I think this is going to work. You know? I think so, one of the things they used to fix this was a tube sock, uh, Roger. So I think you're right on target with that. They MacGyvered it. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, let's not lose the point. Uh, you know, you know, whereas some health systems are have invested in innovation uh, back when times are good. And then they looked at it and said, boy, you know, we, we can save a lot of money if we just broom this whole thing. I know a couple that have done that. It's the time to double down on innovation because what got us here is not going to get us into the future. And uh, and and you're, you're all right. You know, we're not, Angie, I think you said we're we're not, our goal is not to just make a situation worse and make our health systems feel bad for what they're doing. It's just, we, we want to encourage people. You know, we want to give them real solutions, operable solutions, and we want to encourage them. But part of that is just in the midst of the chaos or what is a very chaotic situation. Again, our poor brethren and sisters in, in Minneapolis, you know, dealing with that, you know, 15,000 nurses on strike. How do you, you know, how do you prepare for that? You know, but things like that hitting us all the time, but just try to find some time to get your head above the fray and say, what have we got to do? What, what, what's the next step we can take to get us out of this or to change our trajectory just slightly so that we not, we're not victims that we can really get ahead of this as we've encouraged. So. Well, well said, Roger. Thank you. So, so, so here we are reimagining operations and prioritizing innovations and, and Angie, you know, you're so good at this, talking about demand, capacity, and throughput. This is what you guys, you and Darren have built your business on this. So why don't you just talk about the three levels, Le levers, yeah. sorry, the three levers. levers. Yeah, we're, it's really, really about um, applying a manufacturing principle to healthcare. And that is how, how can we reimagine the way we operate as a health system and shift from, you know, patients just show up and when they come, we take care of them and then we send them out the door to we really take control of the three critical operating levers that will become an economic engine for the health system. And that is optimizing their demand, um, proactively working and locking up, um, making it very easy for that B2B referral channel to get for physicians to get their patients into your health system. Then when those patients are coming in, utilize all of the available capacity with conscious decision-making. So this is truly optimizing your capacity by balancing that demand across your, your resources, um, matching that patient demand with the optimal setting of care, and then executing on that. And then on the back end, um, as those patients are getting ready to transition out of the acute setting, how do you optimize that on the throughput side and get patients um, ex get patients out of the inpatient acute setting in a more timely manner and get them off to the next best setting of care with the right care, um, whether that care setting is skilled nursing or long-term acute care, or it's going home with some, with some interventional uh, services. When you look holistically, um, and this is, I'm really talking about your acute and complex patients, and you look holistically at those three levers, not individually at one levers. Um, I think what we see, what we see happening frequently is you think, oh, I've got a problem with capacity. I've got so much demand for my, back. like, I can't focus on demand. I've got too much demand right now, but we did have inflated demand. We're going to continue to have more demand as patients get sicker, but where you put those patients, how you utilize those resources, how you utilize and distribute all of your capacity inside of your health system um, becomes the, the, real, the real issue because um, we, we, see, we see many organizations that have um, very, uh, very backlogged um, hospitals in their system and others that are sitting there with available capacity. So um, you've got to look at all three of these levers in relation to each other and have a plan to address all. And when, and when you can optimize demand capacity and throughput, it, um, it becomes an economic engine. More patients in, faster patients out, 
spread the demand across all of your resources, match the patient acuity with the right level of service so you're matching revenue and costs, and all of a sudden you've got really an operational infrastructure for, uh, for margin improvement. It's also easier for your nurses, easier for your case managers, and easier for your physicians. So, um, so this is really what we help health systems put in, into place. So it's speaking of, um, Chuck, in terms of this next slide, there was some really interesting research that you surfaced for some of the other panelists that came from uh, Elsevier uh, Health that looked at this impact on clinicians themselves and kind of what, what is happening. Um, can you just share a few of these insights for the listening audience too, in terms of kind of what is evolving at, in terms of clinicians really becoming this partner for health? Yes. Yeah, so let me try to summarize it, you know, quickly, Ben, you know, I think that there's, um, there's some real challenges if you look at this data um, and the real challenge involves the fact that, that, Patients are looking for empathy. Uh, physicians are looking to be able to provide the empathy, but don't have the time because there's an incredible amount of information overload. And I, I actually, I, people say information overload. I'd say data overload, lack of information. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that that's a huge, huge uh, you know challenge. How how can we take all this data that's available? and actually use it to enhance the experience and make it easy for the person seeing the patient to use the data in an informational format so that during the 15 minutes of the visit, they're not spending 90% of their time typing on the EMR with their back towards the patient, which obviously is not probably the best way to provide uh, empathy. I, I think the other thing is that um, it it's become more and more challenging for the, the person providing the care because you know the patient many many times is already coming in with the diagnosis that they think they have from having looked at Google um, you know I, I mean even way way back in the age of the dinosaurs when I was practicing uh, I had patients come in with you know stacks of paper uh, basically you know wanting to let me know that they already knew um, they not only already knew what was wrong but they already sort of had their McDonald's order ready to sort of tell me what it is that they were wanting on that particular day in order to treat the illness that they already had self um, diagnosed. So how do you balance patient empowerment and rather than looking at it as a, an obstacle, how do you use it to actually help free up some of your time to really focus on the really important things? So this balance between more informed patients, this huge amount of data, having time to empathize uh, and develop a relationship with the patient um, it is really, 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 really difficult. And I, I, I think we're in that sort of that, that trough of the challenge now. We, we spent the last 10 years developing all these systems like Epic and Cerner and you know, everything else um, that were really built um, to, to look at billing. Let, let's just be honest about it. These systems yes. were really built for billing. They weren't built for patient care, right? And uh, you know, I think they're perfectly designed for the results that they're getting. Um, on the other hand, I think clinicians will tell you that they've helped in, in some aspects of care in terms of the quality, the indicators, those sorts of things. But how do we now translate all of that into something that's going to actually help take care of a patient? Whether that's going to be artificial intelligence or um, some sort of add-ons that seamlessly integrate with the EMR, I don't know. Um, but th those are really the challenges that I think this new transformation is, is going to end up delivering to us if we can just all survive the trough to get there. Hey, Roger, yeah. if I can pick yeah, back sure. a comment on uh, Chuck's here just uh, just briefly. Yeah. You know, Chuck's, I think, done a great job at um, identifying and, and, and looking at this particular data, which is so important. You know, as I think about um, my practice on the inpatient side, and we know that many that are listening to this broadcast, certainly what we do it about is largely focused on that acute care um, and post-acute care time when patients are at their sickest. Um, and there was a word that you used, Chuck, there of empowering um, patients. I think of um, the, you know, the approach that we're taking. 
you know, we've talked about the fact that we spend so much money on EHRs and other technology. The answer here is not throwing more technology um, at the problem. The answer is partnering appropriately with those who can bring solutions to the table. And yeah, there's technology involved in that, but a lot of it is is you know process and workflow design and change management across the organization. And when I look at the behaviors and some of the ways that people are incentivized to do certain things in their organizations and the way they think about it, you know, as a physician, when do I round on my patients and who do I prioritize? Is it the sickest or the people that we need to get out the door? And how? what's my nursing behavior around shift changes? And how do I look at um, you know, how we're looking at metrics of when we discharge people and is it forcing people to hold them over for another day because their bonus is going to be affected if they, uh, you know, send somebody out the door at seven o'clock at night. I think it's so important that as leaders in organizations look at how they're going to strategically address these uh, needs, they partner with appropriate experts, I'll, you know, um, talk about what we do um, at about with respect to that, that Throwing more technology at this is not the solution. Bringing in somebody who can sit side by side with you and look at these issues and help come up with the appropriate solutions is what's going to win the game in the end uh, because they have to address those um, issues where they're maybe misaligned in their incentives and their needs of appropriate workflow design and change management within their organizations. Yeah. I think there's one other thing too that I just want to point out here really quickly. Uh, on the slide, it says patient dash consumers. There's a difference in my mind between the bucket that's patient and the bucket that's consumer. And I, I think, you know, having been a, a caregiver, a, a physician for many, many years, I, I think most of us on this call think about patients. In other words, they've hit the front door and we're taking care of them, right? And in many of those cases, if not most, um, those people, um, I've got chest pain. I'm in my house. I call the ambulance. I'm not going to be asking questions about cost, where are you taking me, and all those sorts of things. I just want to get the care, right? And and the people giving me the care are, they're, they're focused on taking care of the patient. That person is different than what I would consider a consumer. A consumer is not, you know, acutely ill. A consumer wants to get online. You know, they're thinking that, geez, mm -hmm. maybe I need to, you know, develop a relationship with somebody before I get sick. I want an easy way to get online, see if I can get an appointment, um, find people, do doctors in my in my locale that I can go see. I don't want to spend 45 minutes like you did um, earlier. I think, Darren, you're the one who said that, or Ben. I, you know, I don't want to spend 45 minutes. I want it to be transparent. I want it to be easy. I want to have the Amazon experience. That's where I think folks in health systems, you know, and former folks like myself really, really struggle. And we have to understand that there's a big difference there. And what we're talking about on this webinar, I think, are this, is, is this bucket of people that they have time to make a choice and we want them to choose us. What are we going to do to make it easy for them to choose us? And how are we going to differentiate ourselves so that they can choose us, the payer can choose us, the people with the dollars, the, the, the big businesses and their employees can choose us before they get over here where they may not have a choice and get taken somewhere else. Great summary, Chuck. Thank you. And Darren, thank you too for your thoughts on this very, very uh, interesting reflections on this slide. You know, and as I look at this action, you know, it's going to have to, the solution is going to have to be somewhere too in the medical education, having, you know, been CEO of some large teaching hospitals and systems, we're going to have to teach differently as well. So it's a multifactorial thing. We just found this study recently. Our team's been looking at it and you will undoubtedly hear more from us about uh, the results of this study. I think it's fascinating and there's much more to say about it. Ben, this is our last slide. Do we have some questions that we haven't answered? I know that sometimes we get questions, we've answered them. I think one that always yep. comes up is how do I get access to the slides? Yes. So, uh, and that that is, it will be provided by um, Aaron Sellers, who's the uh, senior event coordinator for Baldridge. She'll follow up with each of you to provide that. Um, we're close to, we're actually, I think, on the hour. So I would just suggest that if those people who've listened to this have follow-up questions, 
that they include that in their follow-up with Aaron, and we will for sure respond and answer those. And in the subsequent webinar, we'll pick up probably with those questions and say, from this last discussion that we had, there were a number of questions we'd like to start with that. Does that sound reasonable? Sounds great. Sounds great. Thank you all panelists. It's been fascinating and, uh, and very helpful as we expected. And thank you all for participating. Back to you, Jerry. Angie, Darren, Roger, Chuck, and Ben. Thank you once again for such an engaging and informative discussion. As a reminder for everyone, the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence has numerous training and professional development certification opportunities offered online and at your own pace. This month, we are showcasing two of our most popular courses, Supply Chain Management and Lean Healthcare Professional. Our next Mastering Strategy and Healthcare Bootcamp, which is presented along with LBL Strategies and the George Washington University, will be offered this fall from 17 to 28 October. Please visit the Institute website at baldridgeinstitute.org slash education to learn more and register. Thanks to everybody for attending today. As a reminder, the recorded version of today's presentation and slides will be available next week. And once again, thanks to all our sponsors, especially the members of the Mac Baldridge Society, who are the trustees of the Institute for Performance Excellence. It is their generous support that makes presentations like today's possible. Please be safe and have a great day.